In Leopold's time, the main witnesses to the atrocities were the missionaries. Living in the rubber districts meant it was impossible for them not to see what was going on. On December the 23rd, 1893, the state sent down some canoes under cover of night to the town of Ikengo. The people were quietly sleeping in their beds when they heard a shot fired and ran out to see what was the matter. Finding the soldiers had surrounded the town, their only thought was to escape. As they ran out of their homes, men, women and children, they were ruthlessly shot down. Their town was utterly destroyed and is a ruin unto this day. The only reason for this fight was that the people had failed to bring in food to the state upon that one day. At first, the missionaries wrote privately to each other about the cruelties they had seen traveling around their areas. But after a while, they started writing to their home missions. The poor people are crying out against the cruel oppression of the state, and well they might. I can scarcely keep my tongue silent when I hear of and see such villainy. In 1895, a missionary on leave in London did go public, but was forced to remain anonymous. He feared for his safety when he went back. By now, the missionaries knew all too well the severity of the punishments the state handed out. They saw how villagers were flogged with the shikot, a whip made of rhinoceros hide dried in the sun till it could rip a man's skin to shreds. They saw men tortured to death with burning kopal. A missionary described how the soldier found horrible pleasure in pouring the kopal over a prisoner's head. Eventually, the Reverend Sieur Blom, a veteran Congo missionary, reached the point where he had to go public. What he had come across went beyond anything he had ever imagined. His reports first appeared in a missionary magazine, but soon found their way into national newspapers in Europe. It was Sieur Blom's report that first revealed to the world the state practice of cutting off hands. When I crossed the stream, I saw some dead bodies hanging down from the branches in the water. As I turned my face away at the horrible sight, one of the native corporals who was following us down said, oh, that's nothing. A few days ago, I returned from a fight and I brought the white man 160 hands and they were thrown into the river. That was about the time that I saw a native killed with my own eyes. The soldier said, don't take it to heart so much. They kill us if we don't bring the rubber. The commissioner has promised us that if we have plenty of hands, he will shorten our service. I have brought in plenty of hands already, and I expect my service will soon be finished. Leopold's soldiers were being ordered to cut off the right hands of dead bodies. Each soldier was issued a fixed number of cartridges before a raid and to prove to the white officers that he hadn't wasted any, the soldier had to bring back a cut hand for each cartridge that he'd fired. Maboko hana, kukata awa, awa, huyo bakata kiliboso, eh, kukata maboko, awa. Bongo bitumba, Oh, ba mindele ba mema kana bino bo bunda ki na bangoto. Ah, o bunda mindele uzo makasi wapi. Makasi uti ba. Mindele a kautu ba zaki penda ba tu mabe. Mabe, mabe nde mabe. Mabe luta tuko luta mabe. Koko tu na zamba, koko tu na zamba te, boko bika wapi. Yari si kamu mune ne. Bongo wana bazo senga bomi mela kabango kautu tangu nyoso nyoso kautu tangu mano kipasu nipenja
In each army unit, soldiers were designated to smoke the cut hands to preserve them. The hands were then taken to the officers to show that all the ammunition had been well used. On the 14th of December, 1895, Mr. Sherblum, Mrs. Banks and myself saw one of these sentries with a, a basket full of smoked hands. We got the sentry to stop and show us how many he had. He took them out of the basket and laid them in a row before us. Eighteen right hands of men, women and children. The sentry wanted to beat the woman who was carrying them for him, as he said there ought to be nineteen and she had lost one. Surely the King of the Belgians cannot be cognizant of these barbarous proceedings on the part of his servants. A confidential letter sent by a courtier to the chief executive of the Congo Free State revealed that Leopold was angry about being criticized for the cruelties in the Congo. But the letter also quotes the king as saying, I know that atrocities are being committed in the Congo. It is useless to try to deny it. I think one can assume that he knew, maybe not all the details, but that he knew that the system of exploitation of the rubber in the Congo uh, had uh, gruesome effects. The point is, did he consider it gruesome? Probably not. He thought this was the price that has to be paid for uh, economic development or whatever. He didn't care very much. He uh, thought that the profits were more important. Tango Mundela yaki na basuda na yepo na kubanga biso. Na kima kina mo na nanga ya mobile na mapeka. Lisa si moko e lelela kinga ina litoi. Ezwa kinga ite kasi na kwe ina mabele. Tango na telemi na sundoli mo na nanga yepo na koka koki mambango. Tango na zongi na ndok na ndako. Ndeko nangai ya mobali ya zaleki kukumba mwana nangai na maboko. Basiko kata yelo boku moko na likolo. Na tika liko salisa ye. Antwerp was where the Congo rubber arrived. According to legend, the city's name comes from a confrontation between a Roman soldier and a giant who also cut off hands. Any connection between the city's symbol and cut hands in the Congo is seldom made in Antwerp. It's as though the crimes of the Congo are totally forgotten, or worse, never happened. Un bilan humain, rien ne l'exprime mieux qu'un adage des gens de l'Équateur. « Beto fe bole iwo », le caoutchouc et la mort. En 1920, le Congo compte 10 millions d'habitants. Par rapport à 1880, c'est deux fois moins. Donc en 40 ans, le pays a perdu 10 millions de personnes globalement. Mais dans certaines localités, les pertes s'élèvent à... 60, 70, 90 Donc le caoutchouc a été la catastrophe. 
jamais les peuples du Congo n'avaient connu un désastre pareil.